Good morning. Shabbat Shalom. What a blessing to be here together. want to give a huge shout of thanks to David and Brian and Andrew for getting us up and going. We are going to begin as we always do with blessing. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam. Asher kidshanu b'mitzvotav v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. V'ha'arevna Adonai Eloheinu et divrei Toratcha b'finu u'b'fi amcha b'it Yisrael. B'niye anachnu v'tzetzainu v'tzetzai amcha b'it Yisrael. Kulani yodei shemecha v'lomdei Toratacha lishma. Baruch ata Adonai ha'melamed Torah le'amo Yisrael. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Hamim, Venatan Lanu Et Horato, Baruch Ata Adonai, Notein HaTorah. As I was thinking about this class, I was thinking, Oi, oh no, what are we going to do? No seltzer, no socks. How are we going to make this an engaging class? And then, Oi, all of the intensity unfolding in Israel the rockets, and the violence, and the pain, and the worry. Today, we are going to dive into liturgy as a way of sitting into what is, praying for what could be, finding the words that will help us to move through this chapter and to be as strong as we can be, the best allies for our beloved Israel as we can be. Liturgy in Jewish tradition used to be fluid and dynamic. Up until the medieval period, there were no printing presses. And so the Amidot, the, the silent prayers that we offer, were created and crafted by Chazanim, who would get up and would think about what was happening for their communities and share those thoughts and reflections and hopes in the words of an Amidah. No one had the text in front of them. The prayer was with prayer that was said. With the invention of printing presses, liturgy became somewhat ossified. Suddenly there was a text, a prayer, a liturgy for every moment. And when that happened, we lost an ability to be dynamic, to be interpretive. We lost the ability for our prayers to be a conversation. But there are places in which some liturgy has remained fluid. When the state of Israel was founded in 1948, the two chief rabbis got together to rewrite the prayer for a country. There had been a practice of Jews of all time reciting a prayer for whatever country they found themselves in, for the emperor, for the pope, for the king, whoever was on top of them, please, 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 God, protect us. Help our ruler to be just, lawful, and understanding. So these two chief rabbis got together to write a prayer for the state of Israel. Now I want to set the stage a little bit. We often talk about the founding of our beloved Eretz Israel in 1948, but that moment was a total miracle in history. In 1948, Israel was mostly made up of immigrants who fled Eastern Europe, survivors of the Holocaust. It was almost a million people, 33% Jewish, 66% Arab Palestinians. And the Jews under the British were not allowed to have arms, were not allowed to be able to defend themselves. There were various groups working in secret to, to develop arms, to develop the ability to defend themselves, but it wasn't a given. And even though the world community thought it might be a good idea to divide Palestine into two nation states, a place for our Jewish homeland and a place for the Palestinians who were there already, the Arabs did not agree and they began attacking the Jews. There were four stages of the war. Initially, it was a civil war. Initially, it was different groups within the Jewish community, the Haganah and Etzel and Lehi, 
the Haganah was the underground military organization. There was a national military organization and the freedom fighters who were all fighting against Palestinians who were just waging violence on Jewish communities to try to push us out of the land, sending volunteers from November to March of 1948. It was just defense trying to survive, trying to be there. And then April and May was the second period of this war. We took back major cities, the road to Jerusalem, took back territory in order to be able to protect ourselves. And then in May 14th of 1948, we declared our state, a state of Israel, a home for the Jewish people. And at that point, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, and Iraq invaded. We managed to beat them back miraculously. Think about the survivors without any real military equipment, without the time to prepare, without the infrastructure, we're able to push these forces back. And by the time we get to September, the war is mostly over. We're still fighting little skirmishes here and there, still taking back the road to the Negev and the Negev and the Upper Galilee. But we've made it through a miracle and now we're shifting our attention from fighting, from just trying to survive, to building. This is the place in which the prayer for Israel was first written. We're going to look now at this initial prayer for Israel. It was published in Hatsofe in the newspaper in September of 1948. Michelle, would you read the prayer for Israel by Rabbi Yitzchak Halevi Herzog? Um, do you want it in English or in Hebrew? Your preference. Um, all right. How about in English so everybody can hear because we hear it in Hebrew a lot. Our Father in Shemaim and heaven, rock, fortress, and redeemer of Israel, bless the state of Israel, the initial sprouting of our redemption. Shield her beneath the wings of your loving kindness. Spread over her your sukkah of peace. Send your light and your truth to its leaders, officers, and counselors, and correct them with your good counsel. Strengthen the, the defenders of our holy land. Grant them and our aloha, salvation, and crown them with victory. Establish peace in the land and everlasting joy for its inhabitants. Remember our brother and the whole house of Israel in the lands of their dispersion. Speedily bring them to Zion, your city, to Jerusalem, your dwelling of your spoken name as it is written in your Torah in, of your servant Moshe, even as you are dispersed in the uttermost parts of the world, from there God your God will gather and fetch you. God your God will bring you into the land which your ancestors possessed, and you shall possess it. And God will make you more prosperous and more numerous than your ancestors. Unite our hearts to love and revere your name and to observe all the precepts of your Torah. Speedily send your us your righteous Moshiach for the house of David to redeem those waiting for your salvation. Shine forth your glorious majesty over all the inhabitants of your world. Let everything that breathes proclaim... Adonai, God of Israel, is king, and their majesty reigns over all. Amen. Selah. So I want to ask, you're, it's 1948, you're living in Israel. This gets printed in the newspaper, and the chief rabbis are asking every Jew in Israel to recite this as part of the Torah service. How do you feel reading this prayer? I, uh, um, I would say hope. Hopeful, you know, it's it really is a it's a prayer that um, that's it, the essence of it is to bring us together as a people, um, uh, you know, uniting us and also um, just the and also the idea that um, uh, that in, in you know 1948 after the war it's still not 100 percent clear that Israel is going to be able to survive as a country. You know, we're just we're just getting started, so there's a lot of there's a lot of um, there's, there's some angst, there's some pathos, but there's also a lot of hope in this, uh, in the in the in the writing this tefillah. And you know, and, and you mentioned the other day. I mean, the fact that this is that a prayer is printed in the newspaper. It just, you know, Israel is, is it's it's really the it's really a unique country, uh, and always has been. Um, and so that so and the idea that um, 
that prayer is essential to to who we are as a people, even if you're a secular Jew. Uh, you know, part of part of that um, that sense of connection and prayer is 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 there. Yeah, that's definitely so fascinating about the context because you know there's so much movement towards a, a secular society um, at the time. But I, I'll say, you know, at the rally that CJP held, the virtual rally yesterday, um, I was incredibly inspired to hear a young high schooler start to chant the the prayer for Israel. And he started in the way Elias so gorgeously starts our prayer for Israel each week. Um, Avinu Sheba Shamaim, Tzur Yisrael Lo, and I was reading along and 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 praying along and every single word from memory. And then he reached this point that we get to on the second page, <laughs> like, oh, we, we don't say that <laughs> anymore, um, or at least we we don't say that here in in our shul, and. Um, and I find it interesting which parts we have taken away, some of which in the conservative movement um, have to do with the Mashiach and our, our discomfort with, uh, with Mashiach. But I'm wondering about, you asked about context mm -hmm. and you asked about original context. And, and I'm wondering that there is this beautiful third paragraph here about the gathering in of the exiles and the sense that at the at the beginning of our nation we really we need that we need to be gathered into Israel. Um, you know, today I just read Nancy Connors uh, yesterday. Beautiful. I remember Nancy Connors, who's in Israel, wrote a beautiful letter to her family saying basically, you know, stop calling me and telling me to leave Israel. <laughs> that sort of our orientation now as Jews in the diaspora is less about let us go and be gathered in to Israel um, and and more about what are you still doing in, in Israel, which I, I think is is really troubling and, and problematic and maybe we need to rethink bringing back this third paragraph. And the other part of that too is also, you know, as you mentioned, part of our discomfort with Mashiach, you know, in, a, in the conservative movement, there's not a lot of talk of God Right, and this the fourth paragraph here is you know unite our hearts to love and revere your name and observe all the precepts of your Torah, you know. So this that um, this you know it's a very it's a very God centered, uh, you know, you know which all tefillah really should be, but uh, but it, it is you know and uh, again we don't we don't do that much as a modern American conservative Jews, and um, I think that's a missing component. Um, uh, you know, in the in the age of pandemic, uh, I think people have begun to refine, uh, re refine their sense of connection to something spiritual to God. Um, uh, but this was clearly there then, and you know, it's, it's also clearly there in um, in parts of the parts of parts of the Israeli society that are, are much more traditional, and uh, you know, in their sense of the connection to the land, connection to Israel, to connection connection to God. I think there's also. In this last paragraph, the vision not only of connection to God, but that the other nations of the world will see the way that Israel unfolds and the way that, that Israel treats its citizens and the way that Israel treats world communities and, and who Israel is. And that will be a beacon. And people will say, who is that God? I want to follow that God. That, that Israel is going to be a beacon of light for the entire world. And there's, there's part of me that wonders if part of why that fell away is also just that through the years, we've gotten more jaded and more more of the sense of like there are real challenges that face every nation in the world, and and maybe that's not going to be what Israel can do. Maybe maybe what Israel can do is just be a really good nation, and it would be enough to just be seen as a good nation and to not be held to the same critique to, to a different level of critique as as other nations in the world. Well, but that's what's so fascinating about this prayer in that context in that time, I mean, the entire aspiration of the Zionist dream, at least, is that Israel should be a normal nation, that we should have thieves and prostitutes and, and people who are engaged in all manner of, you know, things that we would call a Shanda for the Goyim kinds of, of work um, that, that actually show that we are normal, we are accepted, we are part of the, the, population of the nations. And this exceptionalism, you know, it would be interesting to be able to go back in history or to, you know, to speak to anybody who was there at that time, sort of how was this 
heard? How was it accepted? Was it imposed down? Was it brought up? How, how did those who were kind of, you know, out in the fields doing the uh, the hard the hard work of rebuilding a nation receive this idea? Right. And as you mentioned, also, you know, the, of the thirty three percent that were you know that were Jewish in Israel at that time. Um, the percentage of people there were Holocaust survivors is huge, and 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 how the fact that that this kind of sense of prayer and connection to God, how did that fit into the life of many survivors who had probably in some ways stopped believing in God, even though they may have believed in, believed in the, the 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 state of Israel uh, and, a, and a homeland. So it's it's a very con very. very not not a simple thing to uh, to say, you know, and also the uh, your, your idea, like you know, did, was this imposed on the people, and, and what was the reality? Did people did was this done uh, in most you know places of worship, uh, uh, you know, at that time? This was this was it was a, it was a presentation. We should do this um, as opposed to do this. Right. Well, know? clearly it was it was accepted because we still do it today. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, it, it definitely had roots and, and wings mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested yeah. in a piece that is at the very bottom of the second paragraph of um, Vitak Neim Be'itza Tova, mm -hmm. um, th this idea that that it's not just up to us to accept the guidance and leadership of our leaders, but also to invite God to help them to find the the correct way and to correct them when they when they make mistakes and to help them aspire towards walking on a, a good path. But sort of the assumption, you know, Israel today uh, with any number of elections after election after election, you know, certainly takes to heart this kind of guidance that's implicit in in this uh, prayer, which is that it's not um, it's not just that you you follow your leaders whatever they say or whatever they do, but rather that we're always aspiring to a place where our leaders will hear the voice of of wisdom, clarity, justice, and help guide us to the right place. Yeah, and I want to. We're going to continue moving along. I I we have so many prayers to look at today. I want to point out one key piece, which I think is so beautiful. In 1948, there was no real sense that, I mean, there are five Arab nations attacking from the outside and, and everyone's attacking from the inside. It was turmoil and stress and intensity. And the, it, within that, there's still, if you look at the at the top of page two, the Natata Shalom Ba'aras, establish peace in the land and everlasting joy for its inhabitants. And when Shai Agnon looks at that, he takes that out. He's, he thinks, you know, guard Israel, strengthen the position of the defenders of Israel, crown them with a wreath of victory. There's a really different vision of what, what is possible um, and, and what we're going we're gonna to move towards. Um, his is a more, I think, pragmatic understanding of, of what could be and how it could be. Um, I want to move us now. We're going we're gonna to keep skipping ahead. Um, because I want to take a look at a prayer that was written in 2002 in the midst of the second Antifada, and 2002 is right at the heart of that Antifada. Um, and it's, it's a very different kind of prayer, a prayer that's written in the sense of um, that we have a prayer for Israel, but, but serves a very different function. Dan, I'm, I'm wondering if you can read. This is on page five, source number four. Okay. My heart, my heart goes out to you, Zion. Tears, jubilation, celebration, grieving. Did we not dream a dream that came to be? And here it is, both song and lament. We are mere matter, and our prayer is the cre to, is to the Creator, toward the good and the just. Direct the people seeking refuge in Zion. For all the world is yours, and we have but one land, which we inherited together with the sons and daughters of Hagar. Favor us with knowledge with which to understand the wisdom of Avraham. If you will go left, I will go right. Overflow with mercy on a great and troubled land, for Zion will be redeemed in judgment and its inhabitants in righteousness. So I just first want to ask, is this a prayer? Yes. 
Yeah, I think it is. I I, I personally think that all poetry is prayer. So that that's a, a different thing. Yeah, but I mean, there is there's definitely it's definitely it's a it's a it's a prayer for it's a prayer for justice. It's a prayer for um, for finding the road that will bring peace, which is the essence, I think, of the tefillah, the prayer for Israel. You know, if you go right, I will go left. Um, and and also a, a prayer that that all peoples will recognize God, but also peoples all peoples will recognize the presence of God in looking at the person across from you and recognizing that every person is in the image of God. Michelle, how does this strike you? Do you feel like this is a prayer? I, I mean, it's a prayer I studied with Arya, so I, um, you know, I I have. I take uh, his his words. Um, they are a passion of his of his heart, and and I think he's attempting to articulate something that's really critical um, for so many, um, which is this this inherent complexity and challenge that this land is our land, um, and we lay claim to it, and yet we have cousins. Um, who who lay claim to it as well, and how how do we hold that? And he's he's attempting to strive to hold that. Um, I'm not sure. I would rephrase your question: Is it is it a prayer for the state of Israel? That that would be more my question. Um, and I think that can only be answered. Um, by the way in which it is adopted and accepted and 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 the way in which people feel it speaks to them or doesn't speak to them um i can tell you there's a lot for everybody in that first version uh, i noticed that agnon took out eretz kodchenu right our holy land the idea of our holy land and sort of edited it and updated it um so that it but it it it, it continued to be a prayer that attempted to speak about Israel's defense, safety, security, prosperity from a Israeli perspective. And, um, you know, this one is a very universalist prayer um, that speaks to God about trying to find a way to rest in a land together with another people. And this is also, you know, this is the, it, but it goes back to the idea that Zion, you know, that Israel is a, is meant to be a beacon and that the Jewish people are meant to be a beacon and then held to a different standard, which is something we talked about a little bit earlier, you know, whether, whether we want to, whether we, I think whether we want to or not, we will always be held to a different standard. And that's, that's noted here, you know, Zion will be redeemed in judgment as inhabitants in righteousness. What is the, what is Arya Cohen's ideal outcome as he visions the ideal state of Israel, land of Israel? What's his vision that's articulated in this prayer? This is it's like the lion and the lamb, you know. It's just it's just a, it you know what I mean. It's just it's just the idea that um, that we will all respect each other and respect each other's right not only to the land itself, but to um, peaceful, peaceful existence. You know, if we, if we, if we, if we all recognize each other as essentially children of the same God, which is pointed out here, children of Hagar, if we all, if we do that, then, um, then the fighting, the infighting, you know, can stop in some way. One of the things I find so interesting about this prayer, I would imagine if I were setting out to write a prayer about how we could coexist and how we can move forward, I think for me there would be something in there about figuring out how to process everything that has happened, how to process our, our history and the and the wrongs that have been done on both sides and to really be able to sit down and and move through that and what's interesting to me with this verse you know he's citing 
a place in in Torah where Abraham and Lot are having a difficult time uh, getting along, and and they're both scrounging after the same resources. And the the solution they come to is just to separate. Like they don't actually figure out how to share resources. They don't actually figure out how to coexist. They just separate. And it's a very interesting vision for me. As long as I'm in a prayerful state, I think I want a prayer that's that's going to be bigger than just separating and and having like you have yours, I'll have mine. I I want a vision where we figure out a way to be able to share um, because it, it feels like, and, and also I want to name that this is this, right? The context of this prayer is a place of deep pain and deep turbulence and deep loss. I mean, in, in the, in the course of these five years, there are uh, 4,000 some people who are lost to this violence. Like it's, it's tragic and intense and, and ripping things apart. And so I can understand why you would say just separate, but, but I want a prayer that's that's bigger than that. Yeah, although I think he's calling on both the ancient wisdom of the Torah that sometimes the the biggest dream that that you can dream is to is to separate peacefully, quietly. Um, th that would be the lesson of Abraham and Lot, um, and uh, and. Furthermore, I think that his his prayer kind of lines up with Micha Goodman's argument that you know perhaps we can't solve the conflict; we can only shrink the conflict. And and perhaps in endeavoring to create a um, a more limited prayer. Um, he he is endeavoring to try to give us some aspiration that perhaps, although not in necessarily inspiring at all times, uh, you know, of course, the Mashiach coming and redeeming our land and all of us being able to solve all of these things with, you know, with one big giant, the Talmud has this great phrase, teku, which is like, eventually we're going to come and there'll be a solution. We don't have to solve it today, but somebody's going to come and fix this for us. And, uh, you know, those first prayers, which really tap into that energy, like somebody's going to come someday and there'll be peace. It's not within our hands to hold this. In some sense, Arya is forcing us, um, sorry, Rabbi Dr. Arya Cohen is forcing us to, um, to encounter the question of what would it look like if we believed that our prayers might possibly be um, met, like that, that they were in our hands to try to implement. Yeah, I was thinking also, you know, um, sometimes the best way to solve a conflict is to walk away. Um, and that goes right right back to the very beginning of the Torah. You know, um, if, if Cain had walked away from Abel instead of being... You know, just you know, it's part of the human condition, uh, in some way, to uh, to fight with each other, and to learn, it, it, to learn to walk away, and to avoid conflict is sometimes a sometimes a, a reasonable uh, way to. to yeah, I mean, the, of course, the challenge of the state of Israel is that we don't to say away. that the that the Jews should just walk away is an untenable perspective right, right? the yes, abraham and lot story works because lot works in the direct lot walks in the direction we want him to which is not <laughs> into our holy land right, yes. right? but yeah, it also doesn't it. quite work because like fast forward abraham has to go save him he runs into trouble like th their lives are intertwined which is also an interesting part of the story that you think you can separate you think you can uh you know find you you have your land i'll have my land we'll all be but but biblical story is at least that 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 vision has its own challenges, and ultimately we have we come back together. And there's something about being together um, that that's life saving, um, which is hard to imagine the, in the current climate and um, the tension that exists within this system. Um, I want to move us ahead. Um, we're we're gonna just glance at these. We're gonna skip over. Um, this prayer from Rabbi David Seidenberg, which is a um, reflection on Rabbi Herzog's original prayer with a few small changes. Um, one of the things I, it's so interesting is as we move into periods of stability and calm, something that happens for us is we go back to traditional liturgy and that traditional liturgy has both the meaning of the original context and of all the years that we've been saying it. 
since then. And so I think there's something really affirming that at 70 years, Rabbi David Seidenberg goes back and says, I want to trans change around some of the language. I want to make it more inclusive. I want to make it more egalitarian. But at its core, there's value to the traditional prayer that has been recited in Israel since the beginning of the state. Uh, I want to go now to our sixth source. Um, this is a prayer for the state of Israel. It was written by a friend of mine, Rabbi Jordan Bronig, and posted on Facebook um, just this week. Michelle, would you be willing to read this? By Rabbi Jordan Bronig. It is, it, it is possible to pray for peace. Our prayer life needs not know our boundaries. No green lines, no dashes, no subtle demarcations. Our longings can transcend our political ideologies, cut across our keen analyses. Earnestness cast out of our public discourse still has a place in the language of our hearts. We have the capacity to pray for the old couple crouched in the stairwell in Ashkelon and the terrified child in his pajamas in Gaza. We can spread our prayer like a sh tattered shawl, like a billowing canopy, like a sparkling firmament over the tired shoulders of these and across the narrow frames of those. We are not naive, not cowards, nor traitors to pray for peace. We are told to get in line, to stand with them or to stand with the other, but we pray to a holy one who resides in the space between diminished by their missiles, laid low by their rockets, exhausted, but still listening for our prayers. I want to ask that same question. Is this a prayer? Well, so, and I'm going to give you the same answer. Yeah. I, right? <laughs> I, I think it's a prayer. I, I think it's actually a prayer for peace. And, and so it, it, it's in a different category. It's a prayer of his heart for the, peace of Israel through the vision that he brings. Um, I, I think the question is, what is the prayer for Israel, right? It, it, and at some level, there's, there's at least for me, a prayer for Israel that would work would be a prayer that's wide enough and broad enough and big enough that anybody who loves Israel can say it. And that means by chance that some things are going to be excised from this side and some things are going to be excised from, from that side to sort of meet in a middle. A prayer for Israel is a prayer that all inhabitants can recite together. And, and that's actually a current challenge in Israel because there are Israeli Arabs who say, you know, they, they want to also be part of a prayer for Israel. And what would that look like in a, in a modern nation? But fundamentally the, the concept of a prayer for a nation um, is God willing something that is broad enough to hold all who love that nation. Dan, how does this strike you? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with Michelle on this. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a really interesting you know, question to ask what, it, what really is a prayer for Israel? You know, if you go back to that very first one that we looked at, it's really you know, it's, a, it's Israel as the homeland for the Jewish people, and I still believe that Israel needs to be the homeland for the Jewish people. And so to pray for its, um, you know, security and peace and prosperity um, and etzah tova, all, all of that is really significant. Um, and this particular, this particular um, you know, prayer um, has that in it, but it also, it also is, as you said, it's, it's more... It's more a prayer of um, trying to find, trying to find peace at the same time, by, by you know by again rec recognizing our our shortcomings and our look and our, our need to um, our need to uh, not be fearful in in this moment of of terror and this is in this written really in a, in a moment of terror and um so it's it's this is really 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 heartfelt um uh and um i i really love your your sense that you know the prayer for israel needs to include uh everyone that lives there but you know i was thinking about i think what thing what you were just saying about that and yeah. also thinking about but also the the con the complexity of like you know um, what would a prayer for Israel look like to to Hamas, for example, and Hezbollah? Right. right. They're, well, they're, they're pretty, my, yeah. I did say a prayer for all those who love Israel. Love Israel, not, not live there. Right. Correct. Right. So, right. So, 
maybe a prayer for Israel for Hamas or Hezbollah is, you know, this is our homeland. We need to live here too, and therefore we don't, we can't have Jews here. So it's yeah, a very okay, complex. That, yeah. yeah, I think they wouldn't call it a prayer yeah. for Israel. I think they would <laughs> might use a different title for that place. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, but that's... but um, but I I agree that this is um, I also I love this I love this framing of it because. It also this 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 framing of it brings in some really beautiful, you know, a, um, beautiful biblical and Jewish uh, Jewish um, you know uh, um, sources. You know, uh, this uh, we can spread our prayer like a like a like a shawl. You have the idea of a talid or or a chupa a canopy, um, um, you know, and um, uh, um, you know, it, it just brings a lot of. Uh, Jewish context uh, to the prayer at the same time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think in terms of a prayer for peace, right, insisting on the capacity to be able to pray for those who are terrified in stairwells mm -hmm. in Ashkelon and stairwells in, in Gaza, right? And, and, you know, all the layers of complexity that that brings because of the actions of those who claim to represent those people in Gaza and and the responsibility of those people who claim to represent. And nevertheless, a, you know, a, a seven-year-old crouching in a stairwell is a seven-year-old crouching in a stairwell. That's a prayer for peace. That That's a prayer for hope, that's a prayer for being able to hold complexity so that we can see each other as human beings. Um, I, I think that the second piece, we are not naive, we are not cowards, is is much more um, reactive and um, and and defensive, as as it were. And for me, in my prayer for Israel, I would like to not see reactivity and defensiveness. I would like to see a prayer for the ability of the state of Israel to defend herself. I also find something so interesting in this. We started off with a vision of God as having the capacity to protect, to guard, to bless, to empower um, a petition to God to reinforce us to make possible more miracles after 1948. And in this God crouching between the two peoples in the midst of you know volleys of rocket fire and violence, diminished but still listening, is a very different articulation of God and God's capacity to be present with us. And for me, I think I, I love the, the invitation, the determination to open our hearts with compassion at the same time as we acknowledge realities on the ground and at the same time as we work to create a structure that will actually enable us to live um, safely and securely and, and God willing in peace. But this vision of, of the Holy One, again, I, in my prayers, I want, I want God to be more powerful than, than crouching between rockets. I, I want God to have a role in this. And I want to believe that there's, you know, we have not been able to sort this for the entire history of the state of Israel, for the entire history of Israel, for that matter. We haven't been able to find a way to live peacefully um, in the land. It's always been turbulent, always been challenged. Um, and I would like to believe that there's a God somewhere that can help us to figure that out so that that thousands of years of conflict can be resolved and we can say, you know, we made it. We This this year in Jerusalem is, is a year of peace and we, we figured out how to coexist together um, and and God is, is there with us. I, I want to wrap up by, by asking um, just one final question, which is, if you were designing a prayer for the state of Israel, however you define that state of Israel, um, for this moment, responding to the week that has been in Israel, responding to the history of uh, this, our beloved Eretz Israel, the history of a Jewish people, which prayer would you choose? Would you choose one of the prayers that we've gone over today? Would you pr choose a prayer from the heart? Would you choose something else entirely? What would be your prayer for Israel? Dan? Yeah, all of the above. <laughs> and you knew I was going to say that, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, it, it's it's a prayer that really needs to have, um, it needs to have the prayer for the heart of the moment, but also to be able to, 
step away a little bit from the heart, you know, from the heart of the moment. In other words, like not not feel um, vengeful, not feel um, anger, not feel that God is crouching, not feel that we need to be crouching as a people. And you know, the idea that we have to defend ourselves without being without without being aggressive aggressors. Um, uh, you know, all of that needs to be worked in. I I for personally feel that that the God component is 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 really is essential. Um, in recognizing that Israel in the modern era is much more secular uh, uh, place, um, and but the fact that that uh, God's presence, presence of um, of being able to be emotive without um, being too, uh, as Michelle said, reactive, uh, is uh, all of that needs to be part of that prayer. We talked about music last week, and I think that uh, you know, if we think about all the different musical settings for the uh, for these prayer, also, I think that really has an effect on how we uh, feel the prayer uh, as well. Hundred percent. Yeah. So um, I'm going to go with the oldie and goodie. I, I, it really, it's, it speaks to me uh, every Shabbat. It speaks to me now. Um, the the prayer to hold our people in a sukkah of peace. Um, speaks to me very, very deeply. The prayer to, um, you know, Tuknem to to be able to help us to see the right, the right path, the right way, the path of of compassion, the path of kindness, the path of justice that's laid out in our Torah and Chazek et Yadei Meginei Eretz Kodeshenu. I yes. I pray that that those soldiers who are who are rolling out, risking their lives today, will be protected, and that we will be able to see, you know, God willing, something, some way, uh, whether it's a literal Mashiach or 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 the messianic spirit that will help us to find our way towards peace. This first prayer works for me. Me too. <laughs> I you know I I love. I love learning about liturgy. There's also this part of me, and I, I love the idea of a, of a liturgical tradition that can be dynamic and flexible and fluid and, and that you could come into the sanctuary and just you know open your heart and just share the words from your heart in that moment. I totally love that. And I love traditional liturgy, and I love words that everybody knows and everybody can sing along to and that, that moment where we all get to swell together with our voices. We're going to have that soon where we all get to be in the same room singing the same song in the same moment with the same prayers. Um, and I just want to invite everyone today, especially all days, but especially today. We're going to continue with our prayers for Israel in our Shabbat morning services. I want to invite you to sing along with the prayers for Israel, the prayer for Israel written by Jeremiah, this incredibly beautiful rendition. And I also want to invite you to take some time before during and after, to offer your own personal prayers, the words from your heart. And we all pray that on the wings of our prayer, on the wings of the bravery of our soldiers, the courage of those in Israel who are working hard for peace, that there will be a ceasefire, there will be a resolution, and we will be able to chart a path forward in which we can coexist together. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.